So, uh, we're here to talk about IoT and the IoT challenge. I'll explain along the presentation what I mean about IoT challenge. But um, suffice to say, I don't believe that what we have today is what IoT should be. It should be quite different from what it is today. But before that, let me just introduce myself quickly. That is me. Um, working with high technology in 1982. Um, so my name is Thiago Maciera. I work for the Open Source Technology Center uh, of Intel. I work in uh, Portland, Oregon, United States. I've been doing open source for the last 15 years, a little more actually than that. And um, I've been involved, interestingly, with networking ever since I started with open source. So my story with open source starts way back in 1999 when I was applying for an internship and they actually asked me, what do you want to do? So I started thinking, uh, looking at projects that were happening, I decided out of the blue, IPv6. So by the way, I'm giving a session tomorrow on IPv6. Um, one thing led to the other, I ended up working at Intel and two years ago, um, we looked into what existed for IoT, what frameworks existed, and uh, we did not find that there was uh, anything that actually met our needs, so we started our own, and that brought me back into networking and IPv6. So um, what we're using in uh, IoTVT and OCF, which I'll get to, is all based on standard technologies, including IPv6. Uh, so it's interesting that after a long while, I mean, I, I always kept up to date and I have IPv6 connection at home. Um, that knowledge actually became useful when we're talking about how to do multicasting, how to do discovery, how to do connectivity, uh, what information do we get from other uh, devices. All of that knowledge of networking actually came in useful. It's not the only thing I do. I'm also maintaining a couple of other projects in open source, but for the past two years I've been uh, involved well, like I said, 90% of my time has been IoT. So, without further ado, let's talk about the big news, which um, I don't know if, you, uh, if you're following the IoT segment, you might have seen this. If you have not, let me explain to you. Um, the All Seen Alliance is a Linux Foundation co cooperative project. The Open Connectivity Foundation is a separate entity but sponsors another Linux Foundation project called the IoTVT project. So, uh, and what happened as of yesterday is that these two entities decided to join forces. They decided to merge and come together with a single roadmap for creating the IoT solution for the future. And that's the one I'm going to be talking about here. It's the one we've been working on the OCF for a while, but it is the one now that we all agreed uh, this is actually the technology that we combined forces will believe will take us uh, for the next 10, 15 years, hopefully more. It consists of basically three pillars. One of them is the specification. So we're here at the Linux, uh, an embedded Linux conference. We're talking about open source. Yes, we have source, but we need the specification. And the reason for that is that we need to be able to say this is how it should work. There is a way to do things that if you want to re-implement from scratch, you're allowed to. You're not, you don't have to use our source code. So if you're, for example, a hardware manufacturer, uh, let's say you're buying or designing an FPGA, uh, something specific to put uh, all of this communication we've designed into hardware. Well, you can because you don't have to use our source code which was written for regular operating systems. You can just look at the specification, look at how it's done and implement your own functionality. And the same way you can use the source code without having to be a member and pass certification. Now, let me warn you, I, you do want to pass certification. If you do, and that's the last pillar there, uh, you get a number of benefits of passing certification. That's a goal of interoperability. We want not just that you use our software and you read our specifications. We want to give the guarantee to the users 
that this device works with that device. It's a very simple scenario. Imagine, for example, you buy smart light bulbs. Do I have to buy controllers from the same brand? No. I mean, I have to be able to replace my light bulbs with a different one or buy a controller from a different device and my TV from a different manufacturer from the light bulbs. <coughs> right? So we are trying to create an interoperability between these different technologies, these different manufacturers by these three pillars. So again, a, a specification which you can read and which you can implement towards. And if you're a member of the Open Connectivity Foundation, you get a number of uh, intellectual property benefits uh, when, uh, by uh, implementing this. An open source project that is developed as open source that you can participate in and implement on your own project and your own devices. And finally, pass certification. Our vision is to create something that, like I just mentioned, is an open published online specification which everybody can read. The draft standards are, for the moment, uh, only for members. We've been discussing whether we should publish draft standards, for example, on GitHub and people can read as we develop them. Uh, this hasn't happened. It's free. The reference implementation is free and open source. Uh, the standard is published under uh, reasonable non-discriminatory with zero royalty. So it is free. Now, membership costs, but because we have costs, and if you're going to certify a device, it does take somebody time to test everything. But um, plans are reasonable. It's seamless. It should work from any device, big or small. Uh, we don't care which technology we're you're using. We're using IPv4 and IPv6 right now. Uh, there's been some discussion on whether we should use non-IP technologies. That's an open debate because we're seeing IP come into everything. So maybe the problem will solve itself. Um, it's fair and accessible, just like I mentioned, it's open source. Anybody with the merit can participate. Um, we're doing with the large backing of companies and across the industry. So we're, we have representatives of electronics, of chipset manufacturers, like I can tell. We have cable operators, telecom operators. We have educational institutions. Um, it's actually easier if I just show a bunch of logos for you. Uh, these are just the top members, uh, Diamond and Platinum. As of this morning, we have more than 230 members. So uh, please uh, look at uh, the web page for the full list. We also have liaison agreements with a number of other organizations that are operating in an area similar to ours, so an IoT or IoT related. Uh, as a good example, I can point at the Thread Group, uh, which is implementing a technology for mesh low power networking uh, specifically meant for a smart home. Uh, let me just point out as well, the slides will be available online. So you can take a picture of me as well. Uh, there will be a video, but if you just want to look at them later, hey, Philippe, uh, and everything's broken, you, you blame Philippe. Um, but uh, the slides will be available online later, right? So uh, you, don't ha you, you don't have to. Um, so I was talking about the Thread Group. They are creating a low power mesh network uh, based on IPv6 and uh, the IEEE 802.15.4. And what they looked at, like, great, we got a network. What are we going to transport on this thing? Who's going to use it? And, we're, and we on the, our side are, we have a use, we need a network. Why don't we work together? And so we do. We created this liaison agreement where um, we exchange a bit of technology. We have a couple of companies that are members of both. And then we realized, hey, um, we actually need to do some uh, technology exchange. So bringing a device onto your network, there's more than one step involved. And uh, we have a program so that it's seamless. When you integrate your device onto the thread network, it automatically gets the, fun the, tech the information for the OCF network. I'm going to come back into that. <coughs> so that's all I'm going to do about the non-technical. If you want to hear more about the foundation, if you want to hear more about the merger that just happened, you can come to the OCF booth uh, on the upper floor. We'll be happy to talk to you. The rest I'm going to talk about right now is technical. So thank you for putting up with the non-technical. Let's get technical now. I'm happy to take questions. This is a little complex. 
uh, but I'm happy to work with you. And what I mentioned in the beginning about the challenge of IoT is this. Today, we do not have IoT. Let me, let me, let me explain what I mean. If I, and I will use a concrete example. I bought these uh, smart um, AC for my house. Right, I'm, it's not uh, the Nest, I, I just bought, uh, I bought something. It came with a thing that comes on Wi-Fi, which is great. How do I control it? It comes with an app for my phone. And then somebody comes, goes and buys um, those night sit mood light bulbs. How do they work? Another app. So what you do have today is not IoT. It's not the Internet of Things, or even some people call it the Internet of Everything. What we have is isolated islands of everything. You have a type of device that does something smart, thankfully, and hopefully the smart device is smarter than the dumb device, which is not a guarantee, let me tell you that. <laughs> I've seen enough devices that are worse than the dumb counterpart. So you have smart devices that do something, but they don't talk to the other device. If I buy a smart microwave, I want my smart microwave to turn the lights in the dining room on when the dinner is ready. Who's going to program that? The only way this is going to work is if we have a common technology for this. And this is what we're trying to solve. We're trying to create a common technology stack so that the multiple devices underneath can be reached. Starts with a problem of transport. And this is what we're seeing here in this picture. So if you're up there writing your application and you're trying to reach devices that are down here, some of them are Wi-Fi, some of them are Bluetooth, some of them are going to be on Zigbee and Z-Wave. Um, how do you do that? So what we're, and each device is going to work differently. So if I buy two different light bulbs, mood light bulbs, they're going to have a different protocol. What we're trying to do is create one common connectivity framework so that you can find and communicate with each of those devices securely, plus the set of data models that explain what each device is. For a long time, we're going to have the end of the picture there. And I probably should reduce the font size because this looks horrible. Uh, there's a, uh, I think this happened after I just plugged the monitor and fonts didn't work. Um, so on the other side, what you're gonna have is, for a time, there will be legacy devices. So there are a number of devices coming today with, which have, for example, Z-Wave. They have a full stack up and down, of discovery and communication and describing the device. What we're going to do is create plugins, a translation layer, so that if you're programming up here, you can talk to them as if they were local. You can see that the legs here have different sizes. That's because some technologies allow more information than the other. Uh, the example, which unfortunately the name is hidden behind here, uh, this was supposed to be six low pan, right? So it doesn't have any way for us to describe what a device is. But uh, Bluetooth, no, this was supposed, yeah. Bluetooth, on the other hand, has a much higher stack because Bluetooth already comes with a way to describe certain devices. So if I come to my car, my phone automatically starts playing music because it detects as a music player and the car as a loudspeaker. It's a very mobile and big and expensive loudspeaker, but yes. Um, what we need is to figure out, hey, I want to talk to all of these in one way. Our stack is, we selected it to be very based on standard technologies. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to make things simpler and use what is proven. Some of them are not proven because they're so new that we need to prove them ourselves. So as an example, um, where a very important example is, we're not using TCP. And you go like, what? How, how does that work? We're using only UDP. The reason why we're using only UDP is so that we can run on very tiny devices. 
So a colleague of mine is going to talk about this later. Um, and if you were on the other session right here about Zephyr, they would be telling you, hey, we have a UDP stack, but our TCP one, I probably don't want to run it. Not that it's bad, it's just big. And by big, I mean 200 kilobytes. We want to run this on very tiny devices. I mentioned FPGAs before. So we're using, uh, based on UDP alone, so you can see how this uh, builds up, right? We can run over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or 6.0 pan. We built with UDP. We have session encryption, or the encryption is already here, right? So built in from the scratch. We have DTLS. No device is allowed to pass certification without having security. Now, we don't do the hardening, right? Left on the exercise for the reader. So if you're my reader here, you have to harden your device against other vectors of attack. But the moment that you bring it to certification, we're going to test, hey, did you implement the encryption? No? Pa fail. Forget. Can go home. We have a security resource management from the beginning. So every device comes with an ability to set a number of uh, access control lists. So can this resource be reached or not? Uh, I can give you the example of a door lock. A door lock in my house, um, the adults can open and close. That's fine, but not the kids. So if the kid is represented by the phone they have in, your, in their pocket or a dongle or whatever, or a fingerprint reader, well, the ACL says no. You're not allowed to open the door, right? Only an adult can allow you to go outside and play or open for strangers coming in. So this kind of functionality is built in from the scratch. And I have to tell you, we're already thinking of the next one. We're not happy with the one we have. It works, yes. We want to get better. And you can build clients and servers. I'm not going to get much into the intermediary. That's basically a client and server at the same time that passes information along. And you're going to add your own resources on top. So what are the resources? I'm going to get into in the next two slides. We adopted a RESTful model. So what does it mean to be RESTful? What does it mean to use REST? For us, it means that we are much more able to grow, scale, and be native with cloud technologies. These, again, what I said before, these are proven technologies. We know how they work. Um, we're, we didn't use HTTP. Remember, I said we're not using TCP. Instead, what we're using is a, very, a protocol very similar to HTTP, but it is binary and UDP-based. It's called co-op. Uh, it was in the previous slide. It's not something we invented. It existed from the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. You can find the protocol uh, described on an RFC. Same thing. We're using something very similar to JSON, but not JSON, because it's binary. So we're using CBOR, Concise Binary Object Representation. Again, you can read the RFC. We're just using the, these technologies. The interaction is very simple. A client initiates a connection. It, it usually starts with a discovery. Who's there? Or who's a toaster here? And you get a reply saying, hey, I'm a toaster. Or in the case of security, it says, I might be a toaster, but I won't tell you until you open a secure connection to me. And I, I, we've been having discussions. Should some devices reply randomly? I might be a toaster, but I know I'm not. So you have like the TVs replying, yeah, maybe, uh, just to throw an attacker off. But anyway, I digress. The server replies, it hosts a resource. Uh, the, the interaction is do something for me, sends a response, and provides a service. It's simple. A resource, more, a device, look, let's look into inside of one. Um, a physical device can contain multiple logical devices. Why would anyone want to do that? I don't know, but the point is I don't want to constrain you. But think of more simply, I have a, a much more a capable device like my phone, and I have multiple applications running. As simple as that. But it could be for uh, security uh, separation. Some devices are more critical than others, so they run on different processes. Or it could be just the way that we develop things because this one needs to access some hardware, that one doesn't. I don't know. Anyway, um, each device comes with a couple of mandatory resources and a couple of resources that are optional, plus your own um, 
divide resources explaining what they are. Um, they come with a description of what they are, so you can see, for example, that this one uh, is described by manufacturer MNMN, uh, which is manufacturer name. There's one M too many. Where's the second M in manufacturer? Anyway, so <laughs> apparently our guys like a lot of consonants. Um, but that's the name of the, I'm, I'm not joking. This is actually in the spec. It says MNMN. It's manufacturer name. I don't know where the extra M comes from. Um, it describes as, for example, a Samsung device. Why would that be? Well, if I want to find all of my Samsung devices at home, I might want to be able to manage them with a special interface that allows me to do upgrades. That's an example. This one describes each logical device. And the res is a resolution. It's where everything starts. So I ask to all of the devices, ask for their res, say, who's a toaster? They reply. Um, looking into my own devices, so for example, for inch industry, we're going to have, hey, Richard, good to see you. Um, a light bulb, and by the way, question that comes up often, how many IoT engineers do you need to replace a light bulb? Because we keep talking about light bulbs. The answer is none. It's a hardware problem. We do software. <laughs> a light bulb, for example, is described by the spec as a, a device that has a couple of mandatory things, like I showed you before. And it has at least, and you can see they're mandatory, at least a binary switch on and off. A light bulb must be able to, to be turned on and off. But it has a, na a number of optional resources that it can add that are standardized. So if my light bulb can do brightness, great. I just add a brightness resource. If my light bulb can change color, I add the color resource. If my light bulb can do, I don't know, set a temperature, might as well. I mean, yes, you can do temperature of the white. Why not? Right, so you can do cool white, warm white. Um, if it has a party mode, that's not standardized. So what do I do then? Well, I create my own resource. Remember, look at this. This is actually made by strings. I can just create my own for my own company. I can create light mode, uh, party mode light bulb <laughs> and just add it there. How did we get here? So let me just take a step back and talk about how devices get onto your network. And this is important because this is the root of all security. This is called the ownership transfer protocol. When you buy a device, it comes in unowned state. It means I'm ready to accept ownership. You can put it back on unowned state by doing a factory wipe and give it to somebody else, right? Or it comes with a button on the bottom, I don't know. Um, but it comes in an unowned state. It starts up, I'm not going to get into the details of how, uh, this you can read on the spec. It starts up, finds the onboarding tool, which can be an app on my phone, it can be uh, an application on my, my uh, laptop, it could be a remote application on my router, which I access via the cloud, I don't know. Right? But the point is, there's a tool, which we're also developing, called the onboarding tool, it will discover that new device that it's willing, that was in an unowned state. So it confirms the device is in an unowned state, claims it. Now it's mine. It does that by passing along the information about, for example, on Wi-Fi, that's not the case because you have to actually get onto Wi-Fi before you get the information. But on Thread Network, for example, you find the device before it joins your network, before it joins the mesh. And it joins it by receiving via this encrypted channel now. It receives the information of how to join your mesh network. And at the same time, it gets the certificates on all the provisioning data to join the OCF network on top. So only devices that went through this will get the necessary encryption keys and certificate that will validate it against all other devices. And at the same time, they get a set of ACLs. So uh, you can program your onboarding tool 
uh, to always restrict. Nobody can access it but me, so only admin can uh, set information on it. Uh, a very good example is the resource on each device that controls ACLs needs to be made accessible only by the admin. Um, but at that point, you can also control, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this device actually belongs in uh, the upstairs bedroom, so I'm going to add some information to it. I can add some description at the moment that I join onto my network. I can put into groups. I'm going to get into groups in a minute. Uh, next slide, actually. <coughs> so all of this starts from the beginning. We've developed the onboarding transfer protocol, uh, the onboarding, yeah, uh, to be secure, no man in the middle possibility. Sometimes that's a little cumbersome because of the way we do things. So we also have the just works model, right? It's just called just works. It's a, a simple mechanism. Uh, it, depending on how long you take, it might be su successful to attack. But there are ways to make sure that whenever you bring something onto your network, it is secure. Now, um, I don't want to maybe do one, one at a time. I might be able to provision them before they ship. So if I'm doing an industrial setting, so if I want to install a, a hundred of new, these new devices onto my new network in my office, for example, which is a large place, I can do the transfer, transfer before, bring the device in. So uh, for example, uh, pre-provision them with the information they need. I mentioned groups. Let me just explain where the groups are. So we're now talking about the data models. So we started from the bottom. So remember I said before, you have an, on a binary switch. A light bulb is a binary switch. Well, um, microwaves also have a binary switch. Uh, uh, a thermostat has a binary switch, right? So we started from common elements that apply to everything. Temperature is another one. Remember we talked about the warm light and cold light. I can have a temperature resource, which is a thermometer or a thermostat. And they're different because one is a reading, the other is a setting. So all of these resources are described at the bottom level, the, the elementary resource of them, how they, they actually are, and you build on top of them. So I'm saying a thermostat is a switch because it can be turned on and off. It has a temperature reading and a temperature setting. Right? So the temperature setting is the, the one on the far right because it's just something I set. I have a thermometer which has a temperature reading. But I could have an extra device which is just a thermometer which I can't turn on and off and I can't change its temperature, at least not programmatically like this, right? I can bring a flame to it, that's different. Uh, so we build these things from the bottom and the technology that allows us to group them together also allows us to group a series of these into larger, more logical information. So I can, for example, uh, define that all devices in my house belong to my house. I can call them upstairs bedroom or kitchen, right? And I, I'm sorry, I can do uh, queries like give me all the kitchen lights. And if I have uh, a light switch, the light switch controls the lights in that group. So there I have six buttons, right? Some of them turn this light on, some of them those, some of them the other types of lights. So that programming, right, we can make uh, by using groups, collections of elements, collections of groups, and I can create groups of groups and so on. So that same technology, remember, we're just building stuff. We, there's nothing innovative here. No, there is. The, all, just all this putting together. And all of these data models, they are in this website, oneiota.org. You can go there. You have to accept the terms of use the moment that you log in the first time. But they, this site is both a repository of um, data models in, again, RAML and JSON, this JSON schema, sorry. These are standard technologies. And an IDE to develop them. So we are using it to develop our own. The next set, industrial, we're looking into how you describe, I don't know, an asynchronous motor. Um, but you can go and add your own. 
You have a device that um, we hadn't thought of, you can contribute there. Or you have a device that has temperature, for example, but is different from ours. So you can actually go there and describe temp temperature in a different way. Then this other technology, like, like Z-Wave or uh, uh, all join, it's described this way. We don't call it temperature, we call it something different. And instead of measuring in uh, Celsius, we measure it in um, millikelvin because it's integer, right? You can describe all the values, it's just an integer. Millikelvin, no floating point. I, su I suggested this to OCF, they didn't like it. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I did suggest, like, are you crazy? Anyway. Um, so you can actually come and describe other ways of doing the same thing. Now, why would we want that? I'll tell you why. Because I actually want to create translations between them. So this website also supports describing translation, programmatic translation between one and the other. So if I go and create a bridge between OCF world, remember I showed in the first, one of the first slides, we have transition technologies. We create bridges. We do it by examining the both sides and somebody made the rules, so you, uh, you um, divide by 1,000 and subtract 273.15. The rule is there, so I know how to write the translation software. If possible, it actually generates code. We do have uh, some prototype to generate JavaScript code. Uh, most of the time, it just puts on a comment saying, this is what you should be doing, please write the code. It's already, it's not everything, it's not 100%. It gets you a long way around. We are, when we go to our liaison uh, organizations, we go and tell them, hey, we would actually like you to work with us too. We would like you to host your uh, IoT data models on this website. So we're, we're coming up with terms of service that we're going to be acceptable to all of them. Some of them are going to be proprietary, so you have to log in to get some credentials to see some of the proprietary information for some of the other alliances and uh, forums, for example. I don't know. And not happy with just this tool, we created the IoTivity project. So the IoTivity project is a Linux Foundation open source. Uh, my arrows changed again. What the hell happened with all my careful layout? Um, I'm sorry, I lost train of thought. Yes, it's a Linux Foundation um, project. We're using Apache 2.0 license. So if you're happy with that license, in terms of what the patent uh, grant gives you, you don't even need to join the, uh, uh, the OCF. Again, I recommend you do if you're a company because you get extra uh, protections. You get to participate in the next protocol as well. right? And if you want to certify, I think you have to be a member. Yes, if you want to certify a device, you have to be a member. The project is very simple. So if you've seen, for example, how Yocto project works, it has an advisory board, an advisory committee. It's a number of people who are there to advise on non-technical matters. Everything else is left for the technical people, which are represented here in green. Uh, we call projects when it is something specific. We, need, we have a source code that needs to be done, or a section of source code, a module, uh, um, a portion of the code, so we have somebody who maintains the discovery and connectivity, how do we uh, work with uh, finding other devices. Uh, and functions we call everything that works across the project. So we have a function for QA. Somebody is responsible for QA of the entire thing. We have a function for release management. Somebody has to release each of the different projects at some time. Meritocratic, fair, open development process. I remember I showed the vision before. Yeah, meritocratic is there. Fair is there, open is there. And these are no, uh, not anything you haven't seen before. We just want to do a good job in open, open source. You do not have to be a member of the OCF to participate in IoTivity. We have a couple of people who are individuals who like the technology, and every time I come to a conference, I get one or two more. I'm hoping to see some of you. Um, they come join us, implement it, and uh, do something different, to try to do uh, something we hadn't thought of. Why would you join if you're not a member? Well, you can actually go beyond the specification. You can create new things. So let me just give an example. We do have co-op over TCP and the Bluetooth LE transport. 
that is not in the specification. The specification doesn't take this into account. So if you have a device that I try to use with Bluetooth LE, great. Okay, you're not going to pass certification. So why are we doing this? We're doing it to figure out where we should be going. This is experimental technology. All the bridge plugins are part, all, not all of them, some cannot be, but all of uh, the ones we can are part of Iotivity. We're doing tests to figure out how to do cloud integration. Uh, as an example of an experimental technology that became part of the standard, we have uh, the concept is called uh, resource directory. So it is when a device registers itself with another device and stops listening on multicast. So the resource directory was something we created on the source code. We had more or less an idea we were going to need it. So what happened was that the source code went there, tested it, figured out, yeah, this is a good idea. It works. We went back and wrote the specification for it. So what you can do is you can influence on one side or you can influence on the other side. The two drive in parallel. And more than that, an important distinction between OCF and other um, <coughs> groups that create standards. Like I'm going to pick on the Wi-Fi Alliance. We only release the spec if the reference implementation contains the code for it. If it's not on the reference implementation, you cannot require other people to do that. It might be an interesting technology that you wrote on the spec, unless you wrote the equivalent implementation on the open source, on a open source, hopefully this one doesn't have to be, that technology cannot be required for others. The main implementation runs on Android, Linux, Tizen, and Windows. So we actually have Microsoft working with us on an open source project under the Linux Foundation to support their operating systems. We're not restricted to that. Whoops, didn't take it. So we have the implementation for constrained devices. If you're interested in hearing more about it, there's a session later today at 4, 4.10 in one of the rooms up there. So my colleague Keishan is going to be talking about it. It's been designed for scratch for small devices, an example of the Intel Quark family. Um, it doesn't use malloc. It, there is no single call to malloc in the source code. The reason for that is that I want to run on small devices that don't support memory, uh, dynamic memory management. Or I want to be real time. So malloc is not deterministic. I just want to run, uh, <coughs> to do a job. Fully compatible with the, the specification of the main implementation, right? Support for Linux. Actually, we have support. Support for Linux mostly for testing so that we don't have to boot another operating system. It supports Zephyr. Um, and I think that I forgot to add because it was only last week that he finished a port to Contiki. So if you're running Contiki, uh, we already work on this. And he has actually hardware working with it. And you can talk to him later. We have an implementation for Node.js. And it's created in such a way that it feels home for Node.js developers. Um, you use NPM to install it, and the API feels native, feels JavaScript. Here's the API. It's very simple, uh, based on promises and futures. I don't know if you're familiar with Node.js. You probably should be, because it's taking over. I don't like it. I'm a C++ developer, so my talk on Thursday is about C++. But I see people using Node.js a lot based on simple um, promises, futures, and events. Let me just give you an example. This is a Node.js client of Iotivity. <coughs> so what it does is that it, where's my mouse? Here we go. Uh, imports Iotivity node, configures itself as a client, right? Then it will Find resources here. Uh, this was just very simple. You can actually pass extra parameters describing what you're looking for. So um, who's a toaster? When a resource is found, right, run a Lambda. Right? Uh, it will print some information. Check if it's the resource I was looking for. So don't do this. This is not the way to do resource um, researches. You should put the, re the requirement here. So you don't flood yourself with, the res with information back. This was only here, so we actually printed everything we found on the network. Right? If it was what I wanted, I'm going to uh, retrieve information about it. Right? Then run a function. So it's a, it's a promise. 
change a property, and then update it. And if that is done, once the update confirms that it was done, it will exit. So this is less than 20 lines of code. I wrote an IoTivity client. The server is no bigger than this. Of course, there's a lot of code behind the scenes, but this is how we meant it to be simple. We also have a couple of other projects. So like I said, we have bridges to UPnP now. We have bridges to the all join. You saw we merged. That was why. We were working on making the two technologies come together. We have a, a common direction forward, but I want my devices that were on the other side, so they have, they're all joined devices, they feel, they find everybody else on the network. Testing tools, simulation, a uh, couple of other things. So, to finish, uh, I'd like you to get involved. We have the open source project, that's IoTivity. You can join, don't have to be a member. We have uh, the one iota tool, which is again uh, free and open, and at least our specifications are free and open source. Um, again, doesn't have to be. You don't have to be a member. You can just come and participate. And we have the Open Connectivity Foundation, which leads you to the certification. That one is a paying foundation. Actually, individuals can join as well. I don't know how much we. I don't. I think individuals are, is free. Yeah, so you can actually be, as an individual, a member for free of the OCF. Uh, there are certain restrictions. Uh, if you're a part of a larger company, we actually invite you to join as gold, uh, diamond, or platinum member. So that's it. Um, any questions? some kind of scenario for the light bulb on the one switch where the where is it stored and can I access it from the other light switch too or so you're asking I'm just repeating because we're being filmed you're asking where the data is stored your question was mostly on if I have two light switches and white light bulb can I access the information as an example I have parallel switches right they both control the same light bulb and I want to toggle it instead of you know I press the on it was already on it doesn't do anything so basically it's what I said before the smart device needs to be as smart as the dumb device, right? Um, the protocol itself does not say anything, right? This is implementation detail, as in the sense of if I'm writing my application, I need to figure out a way. Now, if you ask me how I think this is going to go, I actually expect that the light bulb is an OCF resource. It's a server. It sits there passively. The light switch is a light bulb, is a Nocia server. It, stand, it stays there waiting to be discovered. It announces when you press the button and says, hey, I was pressed. So what I expect is that there's another device in your network that actually does bind everything together. Because if I buy a light switch, I might want to control something different than a light bulb. I might want to control my garage door or the sprinklers or the pump that, uh, that refreshes the water in my swimming pool. So that functionality is not going to come programmed into each light bulb. What action it takes is something that I'm going to write. So I expect there will be another device in my network, usually your router because it's in a central place, that receives all of that information, stores the state, and then sends the command off. Because I might want to, for some crazy reason, change the light bulb, which light it turns on, depending what time of day it is. Here's what's interesting about this. Actually, if this device, which I'm looking at, I can program it. And we saw this morning on the keynote with Node-RED. Right? So if I have Node-RED or an equivalent technology, I can just connect the multiple sensors. And light switches are nothing but sensors, like contact. Toggle. I mean, some of, some of these, uh, you flip them. Some of them, uh, they come back to the original state. The point is, I can connect that to different things. I can do interesting things. I can send to the cloud how many times I turn the lights on and off. I can, you know, um, if I'm getting a reading from the, the energy company on how much the energy costs, I can turn three lights on 
instead of just one, if it's cheap and it's night. So that technology, that information, I expect to be in different devices. I can write my own applications, and hopefully I'll also be able to download some of your interesting ideas uh, and put it on my own device. Uh, Did I answer? Yes. Thank you. So, so the question is, this rule engine, which I just mentioned, right, can be Node-RED, can be an FTZT, can be something different, can be a Java, an OJS application, hey, an OJS again. Uh, should we standardize the way I communicate with it? I'll tell you this, that we have not, because it hasn't come up yet. But personally, I think yes, to some extent. I don't want to standardize everything because I want to leave innovation for the people who create rules engine. So if I go to uh, Media Markt or I go to Best Buy in the US and I buy this simple router, it's going to have only a basic interface. I might want to buy a more expensive model that has more information, that has connectivity to the cloud and gets information from, uh, I like for the example again we saw this morning, integrates with Alexa. So I can tell you what to do. Uh, it gets the information from my phone where I am and automatically turns the AC on. So that extra functionality, we, pr we probably cannot standardize everything. And we should leave as innovation uh, avenues for the different manufacturers. But yes, we should have something standardized. I really think that these uh, rules engine devices are going to be very important and therefore should uh, deserve some attention. Is that a question? OK. Any other questions? So I'm here for the rest of the week. Oh, sorry, there's a question there. Uh, yeah, you mentioned in your presentation that the, a light switch, for example, has a binary toggle, so a binary switch. Could be, yes. Yeah. So, uh, and the light bulb might have a party mode afterwards. So how could we uh, standardize as a developer in the developer perspective, if I have different features on different light bulbs, that would mean I would have to develop plugins for a central app or plugins for my router or plugins for something else if I want to implement that functionality. So the question is, how do I connect the multiple devices with, with things that were not, features. with special features, basically with features that had not been... Not standardized, not mandatory. That not standardized, not mandatory, or simply did not exist at the time that whoever wrote yeah. the code. So that's a very good question. There are two things about this that is important. First, it is that we are creating uh, for the next version of the spec called introspection. So you ask a device, what are you? What information do you have? Uh, not just which properties it has, but also some human readable descriptions on, oh, this is the party mode, right? Uh, so that allows me to, when I'm looking at my rules engine that discovers everybody in the network, it says, those light bulbs have party mode. And this is what they mean. Here's a link to the manufacturer's website to get more information and things like that. The introspection allows us to find the things that the device has, even if they did not exist at the time that I bought and installed my uh, rules engine router. Right? Uh, the second thing is that Depending on how that device works, I can just, doesn't matter, right? I, it can be either a download, it can be, it doesn't have to be a plugin, it can be simple as what we saw this morning with Node-RED, connecting boxes, right? I can have a web interface to my router, just go there, drag a few things, and now I have something new working, an FTTT. Right? Um, this is a bit more advanced of what we're getting to. Um, I want to get there, definitely. And I think this is, this is my vision. Mine, a couple of other people at Intel, most of OCF as well. This is our vision of where IoT needs to go. Smart home, yes, we're going to see slightly different on other industrial seg on our segments. Point is, we had to solve a different problem first. How do you find the device? How do you communicate with it? How do you represent the information? How do you get its own description? Right? So we had a couple of different problems to solve first. Um, but once we're there, we start to look at the next problem. I think that's it. So let us bring to the beginning when each vendor would provide its own clear platform.
client and server implementation. Mm -hmm. So uh, do we come around <laughs> to the beginning which uh, where every manufacturer is providing um, extensions to the protocol? Um, hopefully not, because we actually want to learn from you. We have, uh, we had an example of washing machines and each washing machine has a different name for each of the features. So mine had, so we had manufacturers no, 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 mine isn't that which you standardize. It's something different because ours is better. Um, so we have to balance in such a way that manufacturers can have differentiation, but at the same time, we have interoperability communication. This is, where, this is what OCF is for, for all of those manufacturers to get together and decide, yeah, this is the common thing. This is such a way that it will work for everybody. And if I just want to turn light bulbs on, they're all on. Right. So uh, it, we do want to keep the ability to differentiate, which does create the, back the original problem. But we're much further ahead from where we were in the beginning. So I'm out of time. Uh, thank you for uh, joining. Like I was saying, I'm here until Thursday evening. You can reach me uh, by email or Google+. And I'm happy to answer questions outside and by the OCF booth, Intel booth, or the Zephyr booth, where you find me. I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>